Good morning to you. Oh, thank you, and good evening to you as well. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for taking some time to schedule a call. It's, it's great to speak with you, and you know, it's I'm excited to kind of talk a little bit about what we can all do to kind of get some more functionality over in Japan. Yeah, yeah, it's it's. I I thank you so much. I I know you're very busy for you and everything, but the uh, thank you so much for taking time for uh, talking about functional neurology. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm pretty much working exclusively with concussion these days. Um, uh, that's just where the greatest need is. It's, most of my patients have concussions, so uh, kind of really focusing on that. Uh, at the same time, I'm building the Keurig Institute's new program for concussion, the Functional Neurology Management of Concussion, uh, which is a two-level course. Uh, the level one is 75 hours. And out of the 75 hours, 25 of those hours are in person. So 50 hours online, 25 hours in person. And that course kind of covers everything from the definition of concussion, the different subtypes of concussion, the seven different subtypes of concussion, uh, how to assess or evaluate for acute concussions. Like when somebody's on the sideline or if somebody falls and hits their head, you know, what do you do from an emergency procedure standpoint? Um, all the way through um, doing an evaluation to understand how their brain is functioning. So that's level one. And then level two is going to be a concussion mastery program where it's going to go very deep into all things concussion, eye movements, balance, coordination, cognitive function. Um, and it's going to be uh, essentially a replacement to Dr. Carrick's, or I should say it that way, an update to Dr. Carrick's TBI program. So that's going to be an additional... 275 hours so it's a 350 hour program uh, it'll take most people probably a year to complete uh, maybe even two years depending on how long they can they can do it but uh, at the end of that whoever takes that program will be one of the best concussion specialists in the world um, so that's something that i'm working on right now uh, that probably won't be finished until 2024 uh, be working on that probably for the next you know eight or nine months just to kind of get it all finished because it's definitely a lot of work. Um, and then uh, I also have some really interesting things that I'm working on with um, with NASA, so NASA. For, with astronauts. Yeah, wow. so um, I'm in the process of uh, working with an institution to s secure a contract that will. I'll be doing a functional neurology assessment on astronauts before they go to space and when they get back from space. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of exciting too, because I think that that's an area that functional neurology can really shine uh, because they, uh, they're having a lot of problems right now with, you know, things like motion intolerance, you know, through vestibular function, as well as cognitive function uh, due to space radiation. So um, and that's pretty much what I'm working on um, that. And also, Trying to figure out if we I'm work, working with another company to see if there's a way that we can find a, a biomarker that will detect concussion. Uh, there's a lot of people that are doing that, um, but we're trying to do something other than blood because it's hard to take somebody's blood in the parking lot or in an ambulance or you know at a football game. So we're trying to find either urine or saliva uh, that will allow us to to tell if somebody actually had a concussion if they need to go back to go to the doctor or if they can go back to play. Wow, well, it's very exciting, exciting thing going on with you. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the uh, why you started really exclusively focusing on concussion? That um, you know, I I've seen uh, Dr. Carrick uh, grand runs when he was in Atlanta in Florida, and uh, I've I've seen he was you know uh, seeing uh, many kind of uh, patient uh, Parkinson's uh, stroke. Um, uh, kids and er, 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 from you know uh, kids to uh, elderly what what why what makes you really really focus on the concussion um so i still see all those other patients like over the past couple of years i've seen 300 kids that have had near fatal drownings in swimming pools wow um like next month i have a parkinson's patient that's on the schedule um it's not that i don't see those things but the number of people that are actually having concussions if you under if you realize the in, the true incidence it's it basically comes down to one out of every 10 people will have a concussion every year. Wow. So that's so if you think about the population of the world, you know, or the United States, at least just 330 million people, that means there's 33 million concussions every year that happen. 
And when we start digging into the research, um, it really became shocking to me that only 20, 27% of people actually recover from a concussion. Wow. You know, a lot of people's symptoms go away, but when we start looking at things like fMRI and functional measurements, if you have a functional measurement before a concussion and then a year after a concussion, it's showing that only 27% of people return back to their baseline brain function. So, you know, that's one quarter of all the people. So that means three quarters don't. So three quarters of 33 million, you know, that's a, that's a lot of people. That's, you know, that's 21 million people a year in the United States that are not returning back to their normal function after a concussion. So I just felt like that's a big area that, uh, that needs help. Um, and I also noticed that I understand it really well. Um, so if you understand something it becomes easier, you can help more people, you can do it better. Um, the other thing is with, um, with concussion, your clinic setup is a lot different for a concussion patient than it would be for an autism patient. Right. And it's a lot different for a concussion patient than a stroke patient, uh, where concussion concussions and sports performance actually go together really well because it's all of a continuum. You know, somebody who has a concussion, you want to normalize them and then you can keep going with that same person in the program and optimize them because it's all about restoring functional integrity. So there's a, a number of reasons why I like to focus on concussion, but, but basically it's, it's just a very, uh, it's a very interesting disorder. And I feel like there's not a lot of people out there to help folks that have concussion. I see. I see. Yeah. It, that, that really would make sense. Um, so typically, um, a, a functional neurology clinic in my, in my mind, let's just say, a, a, let's just say a concussion clinic, cause that's a little bit easier. Um, a concussion clinic needs to have certain things. It needs to have the ability to address all seven subtypes of concussion. So you need to be able to uh, analyze and uh, diagnose autonomic dysfunction, um, affect or mood, cognitive dysfunction. You need to be able to identify visual or ocular motor problems, vestibular, sleep, and somatic issues. So issues of the body. So I think that starting from that point, a, co a concussion clinic has to be able to, at, at the very minimum, superficially evaluate each one of those, even if it's a questionnaire. So like sleep, you know, we don't do sleep studies, um, but we, we use tools that um, have been correlated in the research with outcomes of sleep studies. So it's a questionnaire that somebody answers and we say, hey, listen, you've got a sleep problem. Okay. The same thing with affect. We don't do any, you know, large neuropsychological evaluations, but we use questionnaires to say, you know, are, you know, do you have a problem with depression or anxiety or whatever it might be. Now, as far as some of the other different subtypes, you know, for autonomic assessment, you're going to need blood pressure cuffs and stethoscopes and tilt tables, or at least one of them. Uh, heart rate variability uh, is really important. And then If you really want to go deep in it, there's some more expensive units that you can pick up to measure autonomic function, but they're not necessary uh, to, in a basic you know, concussion clinic. Um, when we start looking at the cognitive type, you have to at least have some form of cognitive assessment because when we're looking at the way that somebody thinks, uh, you can't use a questionnaire like, hey, are you having a hard time thinking? Well, I don't know. Are you having a hard time remember? I can't remember if I do or not, right? So it's not you can't uh, really ask questionnaires for, for cognitive function. So we, I like to use the C3 logics. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the software made by the Cleveland clinic. Um, and it goes through and does the stat five. It does trail, uh, uh, trail making tests. It does digit symbol coding, looks at reaction time. So it gives me a lot of great data, a bunch about a, a couple of different domains of neurocognitive function. Uh, for vestibular testing, I don't really feel like you need a whole lot of technology for that. I think that looking at head impulse testing and as well as uh, posturography, I think you can get a lot of information out of those two things alone. Uh, if you do caloric testing, that's great as well too. Um, but you know, those are really the only three things that somebody might need for vestibular testing. Um, in the visual world, um, there's a couple of things. You know, we've got to look at eye position, uh, we have to look at eye movement, and then we have to look at visual acuity. All right, so there's three different subdomains under vision. So for eye position, something as simple as a Maddox rod can be effective, but I like to use the Feropter, you know, the thing that they, 
they put like, mm-hmm. which is better, number one or number two? Like, you know, the eye doctor, they have those. Mm-hmm. So I have one of those um, at my clinic, and I like to use that to measure people's eye position to see if their eyes are in, out, up, down, twisted, whatever it is. So it gives me their static position. But at the same time, I can also check if somebody's blurry vision is because they have the wrong prescription, right? I don't write, I don't make glasses, but I can certainly say, hey, listen, prescription's wrong for you. Go to an eye doctor. So those are two things there. And then the VOG, right? So the video oculography. Uh, it's a big portion of it because eye movements or orthoptics is a, a big component of concussion. You know, when your brain is injured, you can't control your eyes very well. Um, and we can see a lot of information in the eyes. Okay. And then we have the somatic subtype. Um, with the somatic type, we just want to look at balance, coordination, uh, hand-eye coordination, spatial awareness, uh, and how well somebody's able to move their body, proprioception, um, neuromuscular control. Uh, so gait, um, we, we use different things for gait. We use um, the sport gait, uh, which is a great piece of technology that measures people's gait and stride length and uh, and their ability to walk. Um, and then, you know, we also look at dual tasking with gait and things of that nature. Uh, we do procedures like the finger nose finger test. So, I mean, there's really not a lot of technology from a diagnostic standpoint. And then from a therapeutic standpoint, uh, of course, everybody's enamored by the gyro stem, right? It's a nice big piece of equipment that uh, serves a great purpose. It's not required for people to use. I don't think it's necessary. Excuse me. I don't think it's necessary for a functional neurology practice. I tell my patients that the gyro stem, everything that I do in the gyro stem, I could do without it. It's just faster in the gyro stem. So, you know, the results that we might get in uh, two weeks without the gyro stem, we might be able to get in one week with the gyro stem. So that's a big one. Um, virtual reality has been a game changer using virtual reality, you know, technology and medicine. Um, helps with things like optic flow and spatial awareness and motion sensitivity. Um, we also have different types of exercises to allow us to use lateral flexion and induce eye torsion, optic kinetics, torsion optic kinetics, things like that. So virtual reality has been really a nice one to work with. Um, prisms, you know, working with prisms like to, to bend light to help people with different misalignments of their eyes, super important. Uh, also looking at things like hand-eye coordination, the DynaVision or the Synaptic Unic. We love those for technology. Um, you know, and then also there's other modalities that we use to try to treat, treat the underlying mechanism of concussion, which is inflammation and oxidative stress. So in blood flow, so hyperbaric, pulse magnetic fields, and molecular hydrogen. Those are the three things that I think are really important for somebody to have in a, uh, in a concussion clinic. Well, so the, the generic um, cookie cutter approach, it's not that it doesn't work. It's, it's better than nothing, right? So it's something is better than nothing. Um, and one of the things that we find is that that'll drive some adaptation, but it just takes a lot more time. And there's a certain group of people, a large group of people that will actually benefit from just a very generic approach. However, it really depends on the individual patient. So the idea of having a focused uh, or examination driven treatment modality is that you're being very specific to the dysfunction inside the system. Now, we don't really like to talk about very dis- specific to a certain part of the brain. It's not like, oh, this exercise is for the right cerebellum or the left cerebellum or the right brain stem because the brain we know doesn't work like that. We know the, the model of hemisphericity, um, it was a very, amazing model in the 1990s when we were starting to understand this, but so much information has been learned even in the 2000s and the 2010s about the brain. And what we know now is that there's not one part of your brain that works in isolation. Everything that we do requires our entire brain uh, to function well. But what we do know is there are certain networks, very specific networks for everything that we do. Uh, so a different combination of thousands of areas of your brain that work together to make your index finger move, to make your middle finger move, to make your pinky finger move on the right side versus the left side. So we know that there are very specific networks that um, encode for different types of activities. And we also know on the flip side of it that one of the problems with concussion is that those networks become disrupted, right? They become, some become injured 
which causes them to work less and other areas to work more. So we start developing an imbalance in these different networks. So if you're going to do a generalized activity, you're going to stimulate the weaker network, but you're also going to stimulate the stronger network. So, and I always tell my patients to make this a little bit simpler. If I told you that your right bicep was weak, how would you fix it? And all my patients said, well, I would do right bicep exercises. I said, exactly. So if an area of your brain is weak, how are we going to exercise it? Well, you just exercise it like a bicep. I said, okay, you wouldn't do two arms if your right bicep was weak, right? Because you're going to strengthen the strong side. You're going to strengthen the weak side. And now you're still going to be imbalanced as things start to strengthen. So I think we can look at the brain. That's a very simplistic approach to looking at the brain. And we're not going to look at it as this is the right side of the brain. This is the left side of the brain. We're going to look at it as this is network one. This is network two. Network one is weak. Network two is strong. So we need to strengthen network one. And that might very well be, you know, doing a head turn in one direction or a saccade in one direction or a pursuit in a different direction. Or maybe it's a pursuit at a certain vector, up, down, left, right, up to the right, down to the right. Uh, or it might be a vector of a rounded pursuit or something like that. So it's all really dependent on your evaluation, what you can ascertain in your evaluation about the integrity of the networks and how you can approach it. So this is why we're so examination heavy is because if you only know how to assess one network, it's like that whole, there's an expression and it's in the United States. I'm assuming it probably translates into Japan. If you have an, a hammer, everything becomes a nail, right? If you only have one tool, everything looks like that's, you know, what you can fix like with your one tool. So if you only have one very small evaluation, you're going to find what you're looking for in everybody and you're going to treat it that way. But if you have a thousand different tools or a thousand different examination procedures, now you can get very specific with how you want to fix the brain with very uh, high precision and high efficacy. Give the patient the homework to do at home and how, you, how often you, you think you want to change that uh, protocol. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, so creating the protocol is really easy. It's because in the time I have with my patient, my job, I've got a couple of different jobs. One, to make sure that they're a good patient to be in my practice. Mm -hmm. you know, if, they're, if, it's, if I'm not a good fit for them, then we don't even start treatment. The second thing is to try to figure out what, uh, what networks are not working well in their brain. The third thing is to say, you know, do I have a strategy that might make those networks perform better? And that's where we start. We start trying some exercises to see if the brain starts to change. And that requires a reevaluation. So typically we reevaluate every single treatment session. And then we have a larger evaluation on day three, which is right in the middle of the week. On day three, our job is to figure out, are we making changes to, your, to the brain networks? Uh, are things improving? Are they staying the same or are they getting worse? Um, and hopefully we see that they're improving. If they're not changing at all, then a lot of times we start to say, you know what, this is just not the right approach for you. So let's see if we can find a better referral for you. But when they're doing well, now the remainder of the week becomes more of an educational uh, opportunity where we're going to train them how to do the exercises that they need to do when they go home. But we're going to do that for them at a greater intensity with more specificity to make sure that they get large changes. At the end of the week, when we do our discharge diagnostics, the real point of the discharge diagnostics is to show how much improvement they've made from start to finish, and also the, to let them realize that the exercises that we did here were effective, but lastly, to make any modifications that we might need to make just to clean things up a little bit. But I tell my patients, usually on day four, that whatever we do today is probably what's going to be included in your at-home exercises. And what I just do is I just dilute it down. Instead of doing you know, three sets of 10 and then doing that three times, we'll just have them do two sets of five and that's it. So they don't have an, an opportunity to overcorrect. Um, and then if there's any technology that we are using that they can't take home, like the gyro stim, for example, we'll try to figure out how to reproduce that in something like a, a swivel chair or, or something like that. So we try to make the exercise that they go home with as close to what we did in the practice. And we try to make it as easy to do for them by themselves as possible. 
Now, another question you ask is how often do they do that? Well, typically I ask my patients to do their exercises three times a day because I know that they're never going to do them three times a day, yeah. but they might do them once or twice. If I say once a day, they'll probably do it once every other day. Right. Right. So I say two, three times a day, knowing that some people will do it the three times a day and those people get really great results. But the people that can't fit it three times a day and they're able to do it once a day, they're still going to make gains. Your last question is, when do I change the exercises? I have patients that have been doing the same exercises every day for 10 years. No. Um, and it's just what works for them. They feel great. They're functioning well. Some of them have had other concussions after that, and they bounce right back um, without any issues. So it's almost, I, I, I had this hypothesis in my mind that once a network is damaged, it becomes a weak link. And as long as you can keep it strong, then you may have no setbacks. So the only time I start to change the at-home program is if patients start feeling that they're not, it's not working for them or that they're starting to feel worse again. Then we reevaluate and change at that point. But that maybe happens three times out of 100 patients. Oh, wow. You're rare. Yeah, not very often. Yeah, it's. I think it's because you are very, very good at your you know, prescription of the exercises. I try to get them to follow up with a functional neurologist in their area. Okay. So I have we have a network through the Carrick Institute. I you know I just call up the Carrick Institute and say, hey, who, you know, who is in you know New York City? Who's in Miami, Florida? And then what we do is we make an introduction, and I usually tell the patients, as soon as you get back to your home. The next day or two later, go visit this doctor so they see you when the, you're at your best. So they know what you look like in case you have a setback. And then now they can reevaluate you and see where the change was. And then at that point in time, you know, I usually have the doctors contact me and we walk through the case together and we say, okay, this is what I saw in discharge. And they're like, yeah, this is what I saw when they came into me. This is what they look like now. What should we do? So it's, I, I try not to make people come back to me. I try to get them established relationships with somebody that's local to their area that they can develop a relationship with and they can see on a you know weekly basis if they need to or a monthly basis without having to travel. Yeah, that that's that's awesome. That that's the ideal referral network that you are establishing right now. And uh, I'm trying to establish that kind of that's that's one of my goal in Japan that to establish the connection or the referral network in Japan with functional neurology so that I have patients coming over from uh, Tokyo and Kyoto. I, I, I live in like a Northern Ireland. It's very cold and, and no one wants to visit now in the winter. But still people visit me for, for uh, functional neuro approach and once in a while. And I, I recommend the patient to go to local chiropractor or the uh, very big goal that to establish network like you, you are establishing right now in, this, in the state. Yeah, so we, we care gets to just have a really good network in the United States, but the reality is is that sometimes there are areas like in you know, in, in the United States, there's like states like Montana or uh, you know or South Dakota where there's not a lot of people or yeah. Wyoming, mm -hmm. you know, so we don't have a, an extensive network there. So one of the things I've actually found is that most providers are really receptive if you just call them up and say, hey, I you know I'm seeing this patient from in Minneapolis. They're from your area. You know, I love to be able to, they had a really great result from the, the, the program that we did here and I need some help carrying it on. Can we work together and I can train you on some of the things that I did and the patient can come in and you can help them. And a lot of times people are like, oh yeah, I'm excited to learn something new, whether it's a physical therapist or a chiropractor, they don't even have to be functional neurology trained. Oh, I find that a lot of the people that I connect with are excited to learn something new. And the real big important point is, is that you know, you're going to be my, my hands and my arms and my eyes and my ears. I can still tell you what to do and guide you through this process. So you're not going to be alone. I mean, you're not going to be doing something you're not familiar with. I'll show you how to do this. I'll teach you why it works. And then we'll work on this patient together. And that's, I found that to be very effective as well, too. I, I often get asked with the uh, people who attend my seminar and so forth, you know, uh, since, you know, we are chiropractor. So what about the adjustment or what about the manual therapy and what I asked this question to Dr. Carrick too and Dr. Truster and Dr. Rinaldo too. Everybody has a different uh, opinion or the approach to uh, of their utilization of the uh, 
chiropractic adjustment and care, how they utilize it to the uh, functional neurology uh, care. So what's your, what's your uh, style or opinion that how, how you using the chiropractic scale to the functional neurology approach and what, why do you think the chiropractor is the very good profession to uh, get into the uh, functional neurology uh, profession? Absolutely. That's a, that's a really great question. So I'll start with the first one. I look at the chiropractic adjustment or the chiropractic manipulation as a tool, no different than any other tool. Um, a lot of chiropractors won't like to hear this this way, but think of the chiropractic adjustment like a drug. You wouldn't just give somebody amoxicillin just because then you, know, you have the ability to prescribe amoxicillin. You wouldn't give somebody you know, uh, a narcotic just because you can you look for the situation when that's going to be the appropriate tool to use for the job. Okay. So then the question is, well, how do you know when it's the appropriate tool? Well, there's a lot of things that we can use to identify when a chiropractic adjustment is appropriate. One of the things that we know is that a manipulation or chiropractic adjustment changes, changes the gains of muscle spindle fibers in the muscles surrounding the joint that you was manipulated. So muscle spindle fibers take information from movement of that joint and tell the brain where that joint is in space when it moves. So if you're able to measure the proprioceptive abilities of the neck muscles and they are of high integrity, meaning they work well, you probably don't need an adjustment. However, if you look at the proprioceptive abilities of those muscle spindle fibers and they're not giving good information to the brain about where the neck is in space, then it's probably appropriate for an adjustment. So we like to use those motion guidance lasers that go on your head and we have somebody close their eyes, you know, put it, put the laser at a spot on the wall, turn their head and then move it back to center and see if they're able to start putting the laser back into the right position. This is a cervical repositioning test uh, or cervical relocation test. And it has a whole lot of research about it uh, around the ability to measure the proprioceptive abilities of the neck muscles. Uh, the other thing that we start to do is we also not just look at things as far as repositioning, but also mechanics, right? Where can somebody track something with a head laser? Are they able to control their head movements? And a lot of times when you find that when people are not able to do those things, and anecdotally speaking, when you give them a, an appropriate chiropractic adjustment, after that, now all of a sudden they're repositioning their head properly, they're able to track, because now they have good information coming into the brain. So I think the first thing to understand is, uh, the chiropractic adjustment, we have to, uh, we have to respect the adjustment. Um, we don't just give it out to anybody just because, uh, there has to be a need for it. There has to be an indication that that modality needs to be utilized. And then the second, the third question you had asked was, why do I feel that chiropractors are a good, in a good position to, to learn and adapt to functional neurology? Well, it's, it's because functional neurology comes from chiropractic philosophy. The idea is, is that the body has the capability to heal itself. Sometimes it just needs a little bit of help. Uh, it needs, we need to remove that interference. You now this is, you know, chiropractic philosophy from the early, the late 1800s, early 1900s, but it holds true to functional neurology. Your brain is a very powerful organ. It's the, it's an interface between us and reality. And if there's bad information going into the brain, you're going to produce bad information out. If we can correct information going into the brain, we can correct information going out. So therefore, if we can restore integrity of the brain, we can restore, restore integrity for things like digestion, uh, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, depression, anxiety, vision, you know, because we're just working with the organ that processes all that information. Now, that is, so is a very chiropractic philosophy-based approach. But the other reality is, is that chiropractors have great hands-on skills. Now they've got great dexterity, they've got great coordination, and they look at the brain, uh, look at the a person from a macro view and a micro view, a holistic view, but also condition specific. They have the ability to do that. Many providers are very myopic. They just see what's in that little thing. Like if you're a big toe expert, all you see is the big toe where a chiropractor can treat the big toe, but also treat the entire body. So we have the duality of expertise to be able to look at things on a, a problem focus based approach, but also on a holistic approach. And then functional neurology does require 
um, the ability to have good coordination. You know, if you're not able to do the, the modalities uh, with your hands, uh, the patient may not get well. So chiropractors are used to using their hands. They're used to being physical with their patients, used to having hands on their patients. And functional urology is a very hands-on practice. So I, you know, I think that chiropractic um, is probably best positioned to carry functional neurology into the future. But if chiropractors choose not to do it, physical therapists will. Yep. Because, you know, the physical therapist, this is right up what they love to do. And this is really um, in their arena. But, um, and physical therapists have a lot of skills as well too, but the, the background's a little different. The training's a little different. So I personally feel, and I'm a chiropractor as well too, so I feel that our group is primarily positioned to take functional neurology to the future. But if we choose not to, the physical therapist 100% will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that, uh, like anything in life, neuroplasticity is learning, uh, whether that's addition, subtraction, multiplication, calculus, or vestibular function or proprioception function. The, the, the tenants, there are 10 principles of plasticity. Um, and our colleague Jeffrey Klein out of the University of Arizona published a really nice paper on the 10 principles of plasticity. And when you go through them, there's a whole bunch of things like age matters, you know, because the younger we are, the easier it is to create neuroplasticity. Uh, but some of the ones that are most appropriate to what we're talking about here is repetition matters, you know, to do things, you have to do things over and over again. You can imagine like everybody remembers how hard the multiplication tables were for sevens, right? seven times seven, you know, whatever. Um, if you only did that one time, you would never learn it. Um, and if you, you have to practice it rep with repetition. The other thing is that intensity matters. So doing things with intensity is important. Um, if you just, you know, let's just say you did one repetition of seven times seven and you did it four times a day, well, you might learn that but it wouldn't be as good as if you did seven times 10, seven over and over and over and over again and did that multiple times a day. So, you know, and novelty does matter. Our brain is programmed to detect when things are different um, and something, a novel, uh, a novel stimulus will have more of an impression on the brain. Uh, so there are all of these characteristics that are really important whenever we're trying to change brain patterns. That doesn't necessarily mean with functional neurology, it can mean with eating patterns or exercise patterns or sleep wake patterns, any pattern in our brain, uh, because literally everything in our nervous system is patterned. Um, everything is oscillating, right? Sleep, wake, you know, neurons turn on and off. The sun goes, uh, the planets go around the sun, everything in the universe oscillates. So if we want to change the pattern of oscillations, we have to influence it through repetition, intensity, and also novelty. So those are the three big things that I ask people to take home when they do their exercises that, you know, once you want to learn something new, doing a repetition is important, doing it with intensity is important, but it's also important for me to be giving you something that you haven't done before. That's why, you know, to your point, I like the motion guidance because not a lot of people have that. Not a lot of people are tracking things with their head. Uh, it's novel and it requires repetition and intensity. Same thing with like the figure of eights. Not a lot of people do those figure of eights. Not a lot of people are doing vestibular rehab in a very concentrated and focused fashion. So all of the things that we try to give our patients for at-home exercises are checking the box of novel. Uh, they're checking the box of being repetition and they're checking the box of having intensity. I see. For the, uh, for our, so novelty, you, you mentioned that your patient do the uh, same exercise for 10 years, some patient, right? The novelty is kind of getting getting lost that after you know many years right but but those is kind of like a maintenance or a good stimulation to kind of maintain the brain in good way yeah well i definitely would uh, encourage you to read that paper by dr klein because one of his other principles is use it or lose it right and then another one is use it and improve it so those are characteristics of plasticity so it's novel to create new changes but then if you want to maintain those changes, you have to use it right. and you'll improve it. But if you stop using it, then you'll lose it. So when we start to find a network that is dysfunctional, the treatment modalities that we're going to use to create changes, the, the biggest changes in those networks are going to be novel interventions. 
But then once we've established something as work, we want them to use it and improve it and not stop it so that it loses. Uh, so you know, that's kind of the idea between at-home exercises. And that's where also if things patients stop responding or they res respond suboptimally, then we're going to give them something novel, right? Because we want to induce plasticity and then maintain it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and everything. All, All right. right. All right. Thank you very much for your time. I, I guess it's the uh, uh, beginning of the day, so have a nice day. Thank you. Yeah, and have a good night. Yeah. Sleep well. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay.